Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about energy and some of the work you've been doing. So when we've talked before, you've you've called yourself an entrepreneur. What is an entrepreneur and why do you consider yourself one? Right. So um, entrepreneurship is marrying entrepreneurship and corporate innovation. So successful entrepreneurship requires finding the right entrepreneurs and pairing them with the right corporations that are truly open to innovation and disrupting their own business model from within. So intrapreneurs are one of the most important parts of the future of work. And why is that? Intrapreneurs are self-directed people who tap into their creative energy and bring innovation to companies that need to reinvent themselves to stay relevant and to meet the changing needs of society. So most people are familiar with entrepreneurs, right? Who start new companies, scale them up and try to disrupt existing companies or offer something no one else has done yet. An intrapreneur is like an entrepreneur, but one that is working from inside a larger existing company. So just previous to my current role, I was an entrepreneur and co-founded a small smart grid consulting company that I ran for about four years, focused on accelerating the grid transition. An entrepreneur sets to do something new in business, usually supported at first only by themselves. Um, It's a good way to make change in an industry to disrupt the way things have been done up to now and to be fast and flexible in making decisions, which big companies have a harder time doing. Hear that, actually. In fact, over 70% of corporate innovation efforts fail to return good results. So I was like... Wow, that's a major issue we we will have in our economy if we can innovate well, if large corporations can't innovate well, right? So I became an intrapreneur when I joined Worley to lead a new team inside the company. So Worley is the world's largest engineering company in the energy sector with over 130 years of continuous operation. And when we worked out the first working agreement, I agreed to lead the internal team only if it could operate basically like an entrepreneurial venture inside of Worley. So this, that is entrepreneurship. When a large existing company sits a team inside itself to do something new, something disruptive, maybe even disruptive to the core business of the large company that is backing it. So um, the reason I chose entrepreneurship is that large companies have a lot of resources and especially in energy, have a lot of urgency to reinvent themselves because of technology change and changing needs in uh, in society. For example, to the pressure to reduce carbon emissions. I expected that within a company like Worley with over 50,000 employees around the world, I could scale impact very quickly. And I feel um, speed is extremely important in modernizing our energy systems. So that turned out to be correct uh, because Worley really does have the right attitude and culture to support an entrepreneur like me. And in the past few years in this role, I have been able to mobilize far more people and work on far more energy projects that I could have uh, done on my own. Um, So although a lot of corporate innovation efforts fail, even more entrepreneurs fail. Over 90% of venture-backed startups never make it to have an impact in the world. So bringing these two things together, right? Entrepreneurial energy and corporate innovation, we can bring out uh, the best qualities of both and create something far stronger than either one alone. So we're gonna get back to one of your speed round uh, question answers, which was anti-fragile. You've described one of your personal goals as building resilient infrastructure to build an anti-fragile society. Can you explain what that means and how distributed energy kind of plays a role in this anti-fragile society? 
Certainly. So let me first define these terms. Um, resilient means able to recover quickly after an impact, for something to bounce right back where it was. Right? So you can think of resilient uh, like a foam ball, and impact can affect it, but immediately returns to how it was. Now let's get into what is anti-fragile. Anti-fragile means something that improves through stress or disorder. We know the term fragile. Fragile means something that breaks easily under stress. We often think the opposite of fragile is not to change at all under stress, uh, which is to be robust or to be resilient that recover quickly. But the opposite of fragile is really this concept of anti-fragile, to actually improve by going through stress. Let's get now into distributed energy systems, what they are. So distributed energy means energy supplies located at or close to where they are needed. Uh, there's distributed energy technologies uh, that are energy storage technologies, distributed generation, which includes both renewable and conventional generation. So as compared to the traditional large central power plants, DES are relatively small, modular energy generation and storage systems that provide power at or close to the point of end use. Um, there is not a set size of DES in terms of capacity or footprint because DES can be sized to support any type of facility and installed on site um, as available space allows, right? Especially in the urban centers. So the old power grid, the one we have now that is powering our computers right now, um, um, was built around a centralized architecture with big power plants far from uh, load centers. So electricity from big power plants goes long distances at very high voltage to the transmission grid, then steps down through transformer to the distribution that connects to end users of energy. So there are a few problems with the old grid. One of the biggest issues being power outages. I don't know if you are aware of this, but um, about 90% of outages are the result uh, of problems at the distribution level of the grid, right? So better big power plants cannot solve the problems of outages. Instead, we need DES, distributed energy systems, to put energy supplies right where they are needed and keep power on for all the important energy uses we rely on every day. Um, a power grid with enough DES starts to become resilient and able to recover quickly, even from major events like superstorms or fires. An example of a power grid that was not resilient was what happened in Puerto Rico with Hurricane Maria in 2017. The entire island lost power and many people went for months without any electricity at all. So. Picture living in a hot climate with no refrigeration or air conditioning and water pumps not working for months. Even today, three years later, the grid in Puerto Rico is not in good condition. An example of resilient grid infrastructure is the NYU microgrid in New York City. I was doing my PhD on microgrids in New York in 2012 uh, when Superstorm Sandy hit and knocked out the power for over 8 million people. So NYU at that time had a microgrid that was able to disconnect from the larger grid and keep power on for the university campus. Right? That's, uh, that event in 2012 was the first time the NYU microgrid was tested under real world conditions and it worked proving the concept. Now, the reason we need resilient infrastructure, coming back to your question, Erin, the reason we need resilient infrastructure to support an anti-fragile society is that we need basic services to work uh, or the stress level for people gets too high quite quickly. So an important thing to understand about anti-fragile is that there is a, an op optimal range of stress level. An example of what anti-fragile is in real life is working out at the gym. 
So when you lift weights and push yourself uh, to your limit, you actually break some of your muscle fibers. Right? Then your body builds back stronger and you get bigger and can handle more weight in the future. But if you go beyond the optimal range, you don't keep getting stronger with more stress. Instead, at high levels of stress, you get permanent damage. Mm -hmm. So for society, we do need to make sure we don't get overloaded with too much stress. To stay in the optimal range of anti-fragile improvement, infrastructure needs to be resilient enough to support essential services. Without resilient infrastructure, when storms or other major events happen, the stress level can get too high and things start to break down. So beyond that breaking point, people's lives and businesses are disrupted. But in that optimal range, as the inevitable stresses impact society, especially from climate change, it can bring out the best in us to help each other innovate, be, uh, build back better and grow stronger to, than, than ever before. So to close on this, uh, distributed energy systems make our energy infrastructure more resilient, helping us stay within the right range of anti-fragile improvement and avoiding an overload of stress and breakdown. I like the gym example. I think it makes it really easy to kind of visualize and grasp what that term anti-fragile means. So let's close by talking about how you build out some of these digital systems to really support an anti-fragile society. A study out of MIT called Digital Business Strategy, Harnessing Our Digital Future, provide you some of the cons concepts that you use to build digital systems and bring them into the world. Can you talk about those concepts and how you apply them to your work? Yes, that's a great question. So um, there are a lot of important things from the Deep digital future team at MIT. And I'm not going to go into all of them, uh, but one of the most important concepts I'm using now is called the core versus the crowd. So the core, who are they? They are the established experts of any field. In my sector energy, the core are the grid operators, the utility companies, engineering companies like Worley where I work, power plant operators or lab or academic researchers. Um, the crowd is everyone else, but in particular, everyone else who has an internet connection because the connected crowd can bring their thinking together online to focus on challenges where they bring outside the box thinking. So I'd like to share one example from the MIT course of how the, cr the crowd can solve uh, difficult problems and produce really amazing results. So in this case, researchers at Harvard created a competition between the core and the crowd. The core in this study was the medical research industry. Uh, in particular, it was the Harvard Medical School and the US National Institute of Health. They had a method for sequencing the human genome. Uh, it was an algorithmic approach that used a lot of computing power. And it worked with about 72% accuracy and one runoff process took about four and a half hours. Okay, so we have the core Harvard US National Institute of Health have an algorithm that it worked with about 72% accuracy and ran a process four and a half hours of computing power it required. Okay, so then the Harvard team opened this problem up to the crowd by restating it as a pure algorithmic challenge. They didn't say this is about sequencing the human genome. And they posted it on an online community platform called Topcoder, where people who love to work on algorithms try to, so, uh, try to solve challenges in this platform. So they created this challenge, Harvard created this challenge in Topcoder, uh, which was up for only two weeks and the price was $10,000. And the crowd 
found a solution that could do the same work in less than one minute of computing with an accuracy of about 80%. So the Harvard research team didn't expect that anyone could be more accurate than that. And the crowd had produced a huge improvement in time to results. And of course, in the cost of um, computing resources needed to do a run of the process. So something very important about this research is that people who came up with the winning solutions were young, still students, and had no biology or research and development experience at all. They just liked to code and came up, came up the challenge with fresh thinking. So what we can see here is that the core knows the problem they want to solve, right? And they have the data sets. They can frame the challenge and offer a reward to solving it. The cost of doing it this way and the benefit of the improvements brings far better value than the cost and the level of improvement from the core trying to solve the same problem without the help of the crowd. Right? So the way I'm using this concept in our work uh, in the world of energy system engineering is to take the knowledge from the core, uh, the problems we need to solve, and the data, and framing the problem statements, then challenging the crowd to bring new thinking. So um, of all the questions that, uh, all the questions of today, right, I would like to uh, concepts um, bring all these concepts together and because they tie together. So connecting millennial entrepreneurial energy with corporate innovation through intrapreneurship, building resilient infrastructure with distributed energy systems to support an anti-fragile society and using the core to define challenges that we can solve with the creative thinking of the crowd this is how we build a stronger, more sustainable, thriving future together. Very good, thank you. I, I normally would do a wrap up, but you did a much better job than I could have possibly done in tying all those concepts together. So Andrea, thank you so much for your time and sharing your insights with me today. I, I've i certainly learned a lot. I You introduced the term anti-fragile to me in the context in which you're talking about. And I think that the energy industry does have a lot to learn around this core, core versus crowd concept just because of the way the industry has traditionally functioned over the past you know 100 years or so we're really seeing that democratization of information and problem solving so thank you for your insights today thank you uh for your questions this has been a lot of fun and thank you to c prime for this opportunity uh, love your energy that's something that you have brought to this industry a new way of thinking uh, so really appreciate your entrepreneurial energy uh, to, to challenge us to think differently. Thank you. Thank you, Ariane.